Hello again, everybody. Welcome to Washington Gun Law TV. I'm Washington Gun Law President William Kirk. Thanks for joining us. We listen, we got a big week coming up in Grant County, as many of you know, on Friday, May 12th. We're going to be arguing for a statewide injunction in Grant County Superior Court to see if we can stop the insanity that is House Bill 1240. But as you know, because you all have been geeking out on this channel, the case in Grant County is only one of three current lawsuits currently filed in courts in Washington State to overturn this madness that is Washington's assault weapon ban. Now, one of the first cases that was filed was in the United States District Court, Western District of Washington. That is the matter of Hartford v. Ferguson. That's the case we're going to be talking about today because there's some very important developments on that. I've had a chance to read the pleadings. They are so good. I absolutely want to share some of it with you. So today, Let's spend a few very important minutes and talk about injunction number two has been filed on Washington's assault weapon ban. Okay, so the case that we're talking about today is the matter of Hartford v. Ferguson. That is one of two cases that are filed in the United States District Court to overturn House Bill 1240, Washington's assault weapon ban. This case is filed in the Western District of Washington. It includes several named plaintiffs, including Sporting Systems down in Vancouver, as well as the Firearms Policy Coalition and the Second Amendment Foundation. Now. On Friday, in the matter of Guardian Arms v. Inslee in Grant County Superior Court, we will be arguing to determine whether or not the Grant County Superior Court will be issuing a statewide and temporary injunction which would stay in enforcement of this law, allow us all to live closer to something resembling Americans until the litigation is resolved on this matter. Well, the exact same motion, a motion for a temporary injunction, has now been filed in the matter of Hartford v. Ferguson, all of the exhibits have been prepared. It is filed, and right now they're asking for a hearing date of May 26th. Now, for those of you who've already geeked out about this case, you know that this case, the chief plaintiff counsel on this is a gentleman named Joel Ard. Now, Joel's been kind enough to join us on our channel before. An incredibly bright and sharp attorney. He's also lead counsel on the matter of Sullivan v. Ferguson. So as you can see, Joel has thrown his hat into the ring on more than one occasion to fight for our civil liberties. I've had an opportunity to read Joel's pleadings as it relates to this motion for temporary injunction. And I gotta say this to Mr. Ard, very nice job because you took uh, what can be a very long and convoluted subject. I think you broke it down into its absolute most simple and basic form. I think you nailed it on the head. I'm gonna share some of it with the viewers because if you really wanna understand what's going on, what this argument all boils down to, I think the pleadings in the Hartford v. Ferguson matter prepared by Mr. Ard are an excellent educational tool and that's why we will be posting all of those linked down below in the description box. Now, Mr. Ard starts the pleadings off basically summarizing the issue that sits before the court as follows. The Supreme Court has repeatedly held that the Second Amendment protects possession and use of weapons that are in common use at the time. The banned firearms certainly qualify for protection under this standard. They include the most popular rifles in the country, and estimates suggest that there are tens of millions in the United States today. And I understand exactly where Mr. Ard's taking the reader in the pleadings, and this is exactly where they should go, because this is hitting the nail on the head. Basically, under the common use test, and this is not something that was developed in the Bruin opinion. No, you gotta go back to DC v. Heller. But what Justice Scalia said is, is that if the text of the Second Amendment covers the activities, then unless the government can justify it by showing us some type of an equivalent historical analog, that shows that we as a society have accepted those types of firearm restrictions, they are per se unconstitutional. Put in more simple terms though, what it really means is that the only firearms that we have a historical tradition of banning are firearms which are dangerous and unusual. Dangerous and unusual, not dangerous or unusual. That is the common use test. And so therefore, if a firearm is neither dangerous or unusual, they cannot be banned. Now, all firearms, I think we can agree, especially in the hands of the wrong people, are dangerous. But what is unusual about a rifle that is in circulation more than the most common pickup truck on the road? What is unusual about a rifle that is owned by millions and millions of law-abiding citizens? Now, I'm not gonna geek out too much on the case law, but this is why watching what happens with motions for temporary injunctions is so important because it can really help you read the tea leaves of where this case is going, okay? 
There are, there's essentially a four part test. I'm gonna break it down into two parts to make it really simple to understand. The first part is, is the plaintiffs must show irreparable harm. So when you're dealing with FFLs and things like that, where they can no longer sell these goods, they're gonna go out of business. That's irreparable harm. There is case law that also says, listen, when you violate a person's constitutional right, that is in and of itself irreparable harm. There is no undoing that, and so that constitutes. That's the first important thing. I do not believe any of these plaintiffs are gonna have any problem demonstrating that they're about to suffer irreparable harm. The second thing, and this is the most important thing that you need to focus on, is that if a temporary injunction is granted, what it means is the court also believes that the plaintiffs are likely gonna prevail on the merits of the argument. That is, they've reviewed the case law, they've reviewed all the arguments, they've reviewed all the applicable evidence, and they're like, yeah, you know what? I actually think the plaintiff is right here. I think they're gonna win. And for that reason, we need to enjoin this law to prevent unnecessary or illegal injury to the aggrieved party. So with that in mind, what plaintiff's counsel wisely did was summarize their position as follows. Here, the Second Amendment's plain text covers the firearms Washington bans, so it falls to the state to justify the ban as consistent with historical tradition rooted in the founding. It cannot possibly do so because Bruin has already established that there is no tradition of banning commonly possessed arms. And to further expand upon that, what plaintiff's counsel wrote wisely was, this court's task is therefore a simple one. It must merely determine whether the banned firearms are dangerous and unusual. This is a conjunctive test. A weapon may not be banned unless it is both dangerous and unusual. The commonality of arms banned under the challenge law is dispositive. And again, they're not citing so much to Bruin as much as they're citing to the Heller opinion as well as the Catano opinion, which is exactly what should be cited here. Now, with all due respect to Governor Inslee, not really, um, I know that when you signed this into legislation, your exact words was, nobody needs an assault weapon. That was your thing, that somehow or another, constitutional rights are actually based upon our needs. Mr. Ard, I think, has done an excellent job of explaining away this ridiculous theory as follows. Furthermore, courts and legislatures do not have authority to second-guess the choices made by law-abiding citizens by questioning whether they really need the arms that ordinary citizens have chosen to possess. While Heller noted several reasons that a citizen may prefer a handgun for home defense, the court held that whatever the reason, handguns are the most popular weapon chosen by Americans for self-defense in the home, and a complete prohibition of their use is invalid. And in Bruin, the court reaffirmed that the traditions of the American people, which include their choice of preferred firearms, demand the court's unqualified deference. Thus, unless the state can show that certain types of firearms is not typically possessed by law-abiding citizens for lawful purposes, that is the end of this matter. And in a nutshell, that is exactly what it is. Because when we're talking about trying to ban firearms, the firearms have to be dangerous and unusual. Put more simply, you cannot ban the types of firearms that are in common circulation today for lawful purposes. Folks, this is the single most popular rifle on the market. And of course, the state is always quick to point out, but they didn't have assault weapons when they ratified the Second Amendment, so we had no idea what they were talking about. Well, I will also point out when they ratified the First Amendment, they had no idea that there would be the internet or other forms of electronic communication. When they ratified the First Amendment, they didn't realize that there would be 500 different religions in this country, including some that are rather strange, but they are protected nonetheless. And they certainly, when they gave the freedom of the press, didn't realize that someday they would, everything would be through electronic media. But yet, you know what? The First First Amendment covers all of them. So that argument is bogus. This is how plaintiff's counsel took it apart. Finally, the Second Amendment inquiry focuses on the choices commonly made by contemporary law-abiding citizens. The argument is bordering on the frivolous that only those arms in existence in the 18th century are protected. The court has reiterated this point, holding that arms protected by the Second Amendment need not have been in existence at the time of the founding. And again, that is quoting directly from the Heller opinion. And then finally, to prove that in fact, these firearms are not only not unusual, but may not be dangerous, plaintiff's counsel has done an excellent job of breaking down the statistics and the numbers as to the frequency in which assault weapons are used for illegal activity. And shockingly, it comes out to far less than 1% of all gun crimes committed in the United States. As plaintiff's counsel put it, 
The fact that assault rifles are used extremely rarely in crime underscores that AR-15s and other banned rifles are commonly possessed by law-abiding citizens for lawful purposes. Evidence indicates that well under 1% of gun crimes are assault rifles. And the plaintiff's counsel also points out that hands and fists and stuff like that are twice as likely according to national data, to result in somebody else's death. Oh, and handguns? Yeah, they're 20 times more likely to result in somebody's death versus a assault rifle. And finally, of all federal prisoners serving time for committing gun crimes, a whopping 0.8%, less than 1% report having used a semi-automatic rifle to commit the crime that landed them in prison. And to kind of wrap it all up and put a bow on it, plaintiff's counsel very correctly says, hey, listen, there really is no factual dispute here. There's no reason for some long, prolonged hearing to determine what's true and what's not. These are all actual acceptable facts. And so why don't we just cut right to the chase and why don't you issue the injunction right away? The final paragraph, and I'm paraphrasing this, taking a couple sentences, but I think this really best sums up plaintiff's position here. In this case, none of the material facts can be reasonably disputed. The firearms at issue are in common use, and so the Washington ban is unconstitutional, full stop. Because the issues in this case are purely legal, there is no reason to delay, and final judgment should be entered in plaintiff's favor. Now, we'll reach out to Mr. R to find out, does that May 26 date still stand? Is that the date that they will be arguing? We are hopeful, keep your fingers crossed, that there will already be an injunction in place by a state superior court. Obviously, as we talked about, Attorney General Ferguson, who wants to become our governor now, has hitched his wagon to this assault weapon ban. He promised that he was going to defend this. And I anticipate that we will see multiple injunctions coming in the next few weeks that will put a stop to some of this insanity. We will keep you posted about this. As there are more details, we will let you know. Listen, you may have more questions about what's going on with House Bill 1240 or anything else related to what's left of your Second Amendment rights. You guys should know how to get a hold of Washington gun law by now. But if you don't, that's okay. That information is right there in the description box. In the meantime, I do want all of you to remember that part of being the lawful and responsible gun owner, like we talk about all the time here, is to know what the law is in every situation, how it applies to you in any instance that you may find yourself. Until next time, thanks for watching and stay safe.